Jane Kilgun. Just a little bit about me. I'm a professor at the University of Minnesota. I did child welfare practice for several years, and it was all in permanency planning. I uh, arranged for terminations of parental rights with five children. I came back to school um, to get my PhD because I was so concerned about lack of information about the issues that uh, families and children, about families and children in child welfare. And so the fact that I'm presenting to all of you means a great deal to me. And I am Tina Barr. I'm a PhD candidate in social work at the University of Minnesota. And um, my practice experience is mostly with juveniles who are involved in the juvenile justice system. But I also have experience working with children in foster care, um, children who experience sexual abuse who are, are foster children, as well as the families who adopted these children. Um, also have some research experience, and my dissertation area is in the um, area of wrongful convictions and exoneration. And so self-regulation refers to the capacity to manage a um, person's own emotions, thoughts, and behaviors when experiencing everyday stressors in life. And in self-regulation, um, children develop these capacities for self-regulation when they have secure attachments, which were primarily, when they're younger, developed with their parents and caregivers. Subjectively, um, children experience dysregulation as a loss of control and the inability to manage their emotions, thoughts, and behaviors. And so when you see a child who's dysregulated, you may recognize them physically, like you know, increased rapid breathing, um, they may be flustered or start to sweat a bit. So there are noticeable signs when a child is dysregulating. A lot of people don't understand that children who have experienced complex trauma do have a lot of trouble regulating their behaviors and their emotions. And so I know a case um, that happened in a school where a kid would have, had experienced severe trauma. Uh, Something triggered the trauma, and so he jumped on the floor on his hands and knees and started barking like a dog. And the teacher thought he was just being defiant, and um, so she picked him up and she had somebody come and carry him off into the isolation room and isolated this kid, which is the very opposite of what you do when a kid is re-experiencing trauma. That child needs to, uh, be, to be put in a safe place, but should never be left alone. And as the child starts to calm down, then you start uh, describing to the child what the child might be feeling, and you try to draw the child out as to what happened. You know, why did they um, experience uh, these uh, really very strong emotions that led to these very strong behaviors? And that I can't emphasize enough how often social workers, as well as school personnel, punish kids who are really at their most vulnerable because they're acting out in a dysregulated way. And lots of times kids who have ex exposed to models of violence will dis dysregulate in a violent way. Now of course you have to keep them safe and other people safe, but it doesn't take away from the fact that they're really deeply suffering and you need to recognize that, that the effects of trauma are extremely painful and that's why they dysregulate in the first place. So when children have people in their lives when they're young who are responsive to their needs, then that helps to develop the capacities for trust as well as self-regulation. Uh, but attachment is defined as behaviors that maintain contact with care providers who, s who serve as secure bases from which to explore and to which to return into times of stress. Now the secure base or the, or the, uh, of a parent or a caregiver also serves as a source of nurturance, love, and affirmation. And attachment really is the foundation of the development of the human being. Kids who don't have secure attachment with their parents do have trouble managing their behaviors. And so that's, that's, that's a big issue, and that's the main point. Children who have experiences of trauma and do not have um, secure attachments, they have insecure attachments, this is where we see dysregulation occurring. And I've observed over and over again, when the parents get their acts together and are able to be responsive and sensitive to their children, the children's behaviors do change. 
But there's a, there seems to be a point at which that might not happen when the kids start getting involved in gangs and uh, they're 14 or 15 years old. Sometimes the parents see the light of day and realize what they've done and they change. And sometimes the kids change, but sometimes when the kids are a little bit older, they're much more resistant to change. And so we have to think of you know, other strategies. But the, but the long and the short of it is, if you're working with kids who've had complex trauma, it's very important to work with their parents' complex trauma and help give them the resources so that they can cope with all of their trauma so that they can become emotionally available to their children. In the meantime, you're offering services to the children as well. This is a simple diagram that shows people become resilient when they've experienced adversities, when they've had secure relationships, and, and they cope well. And so resilience, in many ways, is actually capacities for self-regulation.